Hello, today I'm going to be explaining how to determine inheritance patterns in fruit flies, Drosophila melanogaster fruit flies. This is for my AP College Biology students. To determine if a trait is inherited as expected, we need to run a statistical test. That's what the chi-square test is designed for. See, a fundamental problem in genetics is trying to figure out if your results from your experiment fit the theory if your data fits what you expected. See, how can you tell if observed offspring numbers are really the results of, of your hypothesized inheritance pattern or just some random result? You know, say for example, you do a cross between heterozygous individuals, say in this example, purple flowers. You get 80 purple flowers and 20 white flowers. Yeah, that's pretty close to a 75%, 25% ratio that you'd expect from double heterozygous cross. But how do you define pretty close. How do you tell if your results are close enough that you can believe your hypothesis or if it's just something weird going on, something that's too far off. Maybe you have the wrong hypothesis about how these things are inherited. So for this example, we bred fruit flies, uh, red-eyed wild type fruit flies with white-eyed fruit flies. And I've written down a pedigree chart um, with our results and showed the numbers of offspring that we got in the F1 and F2 generations. So Mendel had really no way of solving that problem when he first came up with the laws of genetics, but shortly after his work was rediscovered in, in 1900, a couple of different mathematicians developed the chi-square test for, for these kinds of tests. The chi-square test is a, a goodness of fit test. There are several others, but this is one type of test that's used for genetic work all the time. And it's designed to answer the question of how well do my experimental data fit the expectations that I had. So if you start with a hypothesis of what your offspring number should be if your hypothesis about how the trait is inherited is correct. For example, let's say you have the offspring of a cross between two heterozygotes. That should yield a phenotype ratio of three-fourths dominant to one-fourth recessive. So first, you need to determine the number of each phenotype observed. So you collect the data. Then, how many would be expected according to your hypothesis of how the trait's inherited? And then you calculate a chi-square number using this formula. Let me explain that formula. The x is the Greek letter chi, so that's why we call it the chi-square test. See, it says chi-square. Now, it's not the chi test. Don't take the square root of this after doing your calculation. It's the chi-square test. Then uh, that little squiggle mark is the Greek letter sigma. It means to sum up the terms. So for every possible kind of phenotype, you're going to add that to the total. OBS is short for the number of observed individuals, and X is the number of expected offspring from your hypothesis. Now, this is important. You have to use the number of individuals, not the, the proportions or the percentages or the ratios. You have to use the number to get the correct results with this test. So we'll use this example. We'll calculate the chi-squared number for this example. So if we start with these two parents, five white-eyed males and five red-eyed purebred females. We crossed them, we got all red-eyed offspring. So let's maybe make a hypothesis and assume that this is a autosomal dominant condition. Red eyes are autosomal dominant, white eyes are autosomal recessive. So here for the F1 generation, I add my observed numbers up, 38 males plus 42 females, I have an 80 total. And for the F2 generation, it gives me a total of 108 offspring. Now that's the number that I actually observed. But what I want to do now is compare that to the number I would have expected. For the F1 generation, I'm expecting half to be male and half to be female. So I expect 40 males and 40 females, all of which should be red-eyed. So I'll write observed in red, and I'll write expected in blue underneath to compare to. And then I can do my chi-square calculation out to the side. So chi-squared is going to be the sum of my first type of offspring, which is the red-eyed males. That's 38 observed minus 40 expected. Square that divided by 40, which was the number I expected. Then I'm going to add to that the number of, then I'm going to add to that the second type of offspring, the red-eyed females. I observed 42, I expected 40. Subtract 40 from 42 and square that, then divide it by the number expected, which was 40. When I add that calculation together, I get 0 0.1 for the first type of offspring, 
also 0 0.1 for the second type of, uh, type of offspring, for a total chi-square value of 0 0.2. But what does that number mean? Now, how do you tell a really unlikely but correct result from a, a wrong result? Let's say I misunderstood, I, I came up with a wrong hypothesis for how red-eyed, white-eyed color is inherited in fruit flies. The simple answer is you can never really tell for certain that a given result is too far off. Now, the result you got was impossible based on the hypothesis you used. I mean, it could happen. It may just be very unlikely. There's two ways of getting a high chi-square number. You can get an unusual result from your correct hypothesis, or you could have a result from a wrong hypothesis. And you never really can tell for sure. All you can do is determine whether a given result is likely or unlikely. So how often is a reasonable result? I mean, if it's unlikely, then if it happens very often, you might not say that's very reasonable. So for most scientists, and for the purposes of our class, uh, a result is said to not differ significantly from expectations if it could happen no more than one time in 20. If it happens uh, you know, less than one time in 20, we're, we're okay with that. Well, one time in 20 it can be written as a probability value. That's p equals 0 0.05. Another way of saying that is that you're 95% confident your hypothesis is correct. Now, I know it's not technically correct, but for beginners, to help you understand, you're pretty confident that your hypothesis is correct. Now, statisticians, they always say fail to reject their hypothesis instead of accept your hypothesis. But for our purposes, it's essentially the same thing. If you say you fail to reject your hypothesis, you're going to say, well, I, I have enough confidence in my hypothesis to accept it. But technically, you need to understand you're not really accepting it. There always could be some other explanation for how you got that result. You just say you fail to reject your hypothesis. Now, to use the chi-square test, you have to know how many degrees of freedom. Now, what that really means, it's, it's essentially the number of independent variables that are involved. Now, for example, if you toss a coin 100 times and you tell me you got 46 heads, do I already know the number of tails you got, or am I free to choose a number for the tails? See, that determines your degrees of freedom. With a coin toss, since there's only two possible conditions, if you tell me one, I know the other one automatically. So you really only have one degree of freedom. You're free to tell me the first condition. Once you tell me that, I know the second. But, for example, if you have four possible types of offspring, say wild-type males, wild-type females, mutant males, mutant females, and I tell you that 27 out of 83 were mutant males, do you know how many of each of the other types there were? Not really. You really have three more possible numbers that could go there. Three degrees of freedom. So the degrees of freedom is really the number of possible outcomes minus one. It's always the number of possible outcomes minus one. Now the critical value in a chi-square test is the value at which you say, okay, beyond that number, I, I'm going to have to reject my hypothesis. I just don't have confidence in it. But if the number is less than that critical value, you can fail to reject your hypothesis, or in other words, accept it, believe that your hypothesis could be correct. If your calculated chi-square value is greater than the critical value from a table, then you reject your hypothesis for how the trait is inherited. But if your chi-square number is less than the critical value, you fail to reject, or in other words, accept your hypothesis for how your trait is inherited. Now on the chi-square table, you have to use the correct degrees of freedom and the probability level that you decided that you were confident in. So we're going to use the 0.05 probability level. So here's our chi-square table. For our example, we had two types of offspring. So we would use the one degree of freedom row, and we're going to use the 0 0.05 probability for our confidence. So the number that our critical number that we're looking at is 3.841. And our calculation here of 0 0.2 for our chi-square number is way smaller than 3.841. So I would fail to reject my hypothesis that red eyes is autosomal dominant and white eyes is autosomal recessive. But now let's go to the next generation, the F2 generation. We'll calculate the chi-square value for that. For this generation, I have 108 offspring. I'm expecting three-fourths of those to be red-eyed and one-fourth to be white-eyed. I'm also expecting half of my offspring to be males and half females. So let's take half of 108, and that's 54, times it by 
that would give me my three-fourths of red-eyed males that I expect. 54 times 0.75 is 40.5. And of course the rest of the males, the rest of the 54, I would expect to be white-eyed. Or I can take 54 and times it by 0.25, 13.5. And I'm expecting the same numbers for the females. Now I'll calculate my chi-square value with these numbers of observed and expected. So here I show my 31 observed minus 13.5 expected for my white-eyed males. Square that number and divide by the number expected. Here is my numbers for the red-eyed males. 25 minus 40.5 squared divided by 40.5. For the white-eyed females, 28 observed minus 13.5 expected. Square that divided by the expected 13.5. And the last condition, red-eyed females, I had 24 observed minus 40.5 expected, square that, divided by 40.5. When I add all those up, I get 22.69 plus 5.93 plus 15.57 plus 6.72. I've rounded the numbers a little. And the total, 50.91. That's a huge chi-square number, way larger than our chi-square value. Now again, I've got four types of offspring, so I actually have three degrees of freedom. Remember, the degrees of freedom is the number of possible outcomes minus one. So four types of offspring minus one, three degrees of freedom. I'm using 0 0.05 as my probability value that I'm willing to accept. Uh, so I look at the three degrees of freedom, 0 0.05, I get 7.815. But my chi-square value was way higher than that. So I have to reject my hypothesis. I just am not confident then that red eyes are autosomal dominant and white eyes are autosomal recessive. It just doesn't seem to be true. But now that condition could happen. I could have gotten those numbers. Just, just might just be a weird set of numbers that just happened to result. But that would be very unlikely. So I'm going to reject that hypothesis and look for a different explanation. Let's take a look at this case. Case number two, I just used the opposite. I have red-eyed males and white-eyed females this time. But when I look at my F1 generation, something strange here. I have all the males have white eyes, all the females have red eyes. This may be then a sex-linked trait. So let's take that as a different hypothesis, a new hypothesis. Maybe if I say that white eyes might be sex-linked recessive and red eyes sex-linked dominant, let me try that as a hypothesis and see if my new chi-square value would match. In this case, I'm going to write chromosomes up, males XY, female XX, and I'll say that in my hypothesis that red is dominant, a sex-linked dominant trait, white is sex-linked recessive. So this hypothesis seems to make sense if we use our genotypes, but now let's calculate the numbers. So here are the numbers actually observed. Now of the 79 in the F1 generation, half should be male and half female, and I expect the half that are male to be white-eyed and the half that are female to be red-eyed. So I expect 39.5 of each. So I got for the first condition, 38 minus 39.5 squared divided by 39.5, plus the second condition, 41 minus 39.5 squared divided by 39.5. Each of those is 0 0.057 for a total of 0.114. And that number is going to be way less when I look at my chi-squared table with one degree of freedom, 0 0.05 probability value, my number 0.114 is way less than 3.841, so I fail to reject my hypothesis. Now for the F2 generation, in this case, I'm expecting one-fourth of each of those types of offspring. Not 75%, 25% anymore. It's not a dominant recessive autosomal trait. So I'm going to take the 112, divide it by 4. That gives me 28. And then I'll write up my chi-square calculation below each of the types of offspring. And my final chi-square number is 0 0.929. This time I have three degrees of freedom. Again, my 0 0.05 confidence. 7.815 is my critical value. 0 0.0929 is way less than 7.815, so I fail to reject my hypothesis. That's how you use the chi-square test to check if you are confident in your hypothesis or if you must reject that hypothesis. Now, I could go back and recalculate the chi-square value for this first case using the hypothesis of sex-linked and see if the number comes out to be more acceptable. And I'll leave that to you to do that calculation.
Hopefully this has been a good review and a good lesson to you of how to use the chi-square test so that you can be confident of your conclusions from your fruit fly genetic studies.